Hi, this is Professor Fernandez. We're going to work on class notes D in lesson um, 11. And this example is very similar to the one that preceded it. And, and what I'll do in this video is very similar to what I did in that video. The difference is that now instead of dealing with the ODE y prime equals uh, y prime minus y equals zero, we are dealing with the ODE y double prime minus y equals zero. So this is a second order ODE. It's linear and it's homogeneous. The first part of this example reminds you that the fundamental solutions to this ODE are e to the t and e to the minus t. Again, very, very quick review. Uh, this is a constant coefficient sold. So the characteristic equation is r squared minus 1 equals 0, which has the distinct and real roots negative 1 and 1. And those give rise to the exponential solutions. Right? So we talked about that. Um, I want to say it might have been less than seven or eight or so, but certainly earlier in the course. All right, so part A says, remember, these are the fundamental solutions. Great. Show that these are linearly independent solutions. Great. So I'm just going to use the definition of linear independence. So I would like C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2 when set equal to the zero element of the space, the zero function. I would like this to imply that all of the C's are zero. All right, so let's see what works out, uh, if that works out here. So y1 is e to the t, y2 is e to the minus t. Set that equals zero. At this point, you might be thinking, how could I possibly get this to work out, right? I only have one equation. Um, and I'm going to say, let's put on our calculus hat. We have an equation here, which involves a variable t. And certainly, we want this to be true for all t, right? the uh, condition here for linear independence does not tell you otherwise. It doesn't tell you, you know, we want this to be only linearly independent for t equals 7 or t equals 49, right? The assumption is that this is just linearly independent regardless of the t value. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to this condition and I'm going to uh, first equation and I'm going to differentiate it. And that is the, the big aha moment. So if I differentiate it, um, the derivative of e to the t is e to the t. The derivative e to the minus t is um, negative e to the minus t. So I'm going to put that, oops, I'm going to put that in there. Minus c2 e to the minus t equals zero. And there we go. I have created almost like magic, right? Conjured up, conjured up a second equation to help me solve this system. Um, we've done a lot of linear algebra at this point. There are a lot of different ways you can solve it. But I'm just going to take the most uh, uh, straightforward way. I'm going to add the two equations. Why? Because when I do that, these two terms are going to cancel. And I'll be left with 2c1 e to the t equals 0. Uh, I divide by 2. That gives me c1 e to the t equals 0. And then I'm going to observe that e to the t, this is the exponential function, is never equal to 0. Okay? There is no t value that you could plug in to e to the t that would give you 0. So this implies that c1 must be 0 in order for this equation to work out. Great. So now I have concluded that c1 is 0. And you can see that if I go back to any one of these equations that I originally had, if c1 is 0, then I'm kind of back in the same boat, right? If this is equal to 0, exponential is never 0, c2 must be 0. If this is equal to 0, decaying exponential, you know, the same thing is never 0. This needs to be 0 also. Um, so this, all of that implies that c1 equals c2 equals zero. So linearly independent. Great. So we've done part A. And let's scroll back up and see what we're doing for part B. So part B says that, um, notice that this is a constant coefficient, linear, second order, homogeneous ODE. It's very nice from the perspective of the functions that are involved. Uh, it satisfies all the assumptions of theorem three way back in the beginning of the course that told us that every um, solution would be a linear combination of the fundamental solutions, in this case, these two. So this uh, part of the example says, interpret this in the context of the definition of 11.1.1. Um, so I'm just going to scroll back up there, uh, remind you again what that definition is. So 11.1.1. OK, so um, well, what's, what's going on here? Um, Oop, that's theorem 11.1.1. Let me keep going. So this is going to be our definition of, there it is, at the top, 11.1.1. Um, 
interpret that statement in this context is going to send us down here to span, right? And you can see the statement over here. If every x and v can be expressed as a linear combination of x1 through xn. All right, so what we are being told, just like we were being told in a previous example, uh, a previous video, is, sorry for the scrolling here, um, this example in 11.4, right, this is exactly what we um, drew from the uh, uh, fact that every solution can be written as, there it is up there, every solution can be written as a, quote, linear combination of e to the t, that was the spanning um, information that we were given. Um, same thing is happening in this example. I'm going to scroll one more. Sorry, bear with me. Um, so interpret this conclusion, the conclusion that every solution can be written as a linear combination of y1 and y2. Interpret that conclusion in terms of the definition. That's telling us that e to the t and e to the minus t, the two fundamental solutions, span the space of solutions. So I'm going to write that here. So b. This tells us that y1 is e to the t and y2 is e to the minus t span the set of solutions to y double prime minus y equals 0. OK, so we just showed in part A that these two um, solutions are linearly independent. We just showed now that they span. So part C then asks us to put all this stuff together. So drawing on your work in A and B, find a basis and find the dimension. Great. So we know from A that these two functions, e to the t and e to the minus t, are linear and independent. We know from B that they span. So uh, y1 equals e to the t and y2 equals e to the minus t are a basis for, um, I think I might have called it uh, z. So there it is up there, the set of solutions to y over prime minus y equals 0. Great. Uh, and then the dimension. So dimension of z is the number of elements in the basis. In this case, we have two elements in the basis, so the dimension is 2. And that's it for this example.